So if you have a look in the bulletin, uh, there's a photo. In the short bulletin, it's on page 5, and in the long bulletin, it's on page 9. And uh, we have all seen photos like this for a million times. These guys are proudly posing with guns and RPGs, and these guys are, of course, Islamist militants. If you ask them, I'm sure they are under the impression that they are our enemies. So, when Jesus says to those who listen, love your enemies, those are the guys he's talking about. I don't know about you, but I am having a really hard time finding any love for them in my heart. But there's Jesus, and he tells me through the scriptures to love these guys. I'm not sure how it actually looks like loving enemies. I'm pretty sure it's not walking up to these militants with a big smile and uh, suggest to hold hands, forget about all the evil they have done, and sing Kumbaya together. Enemies are not usually the people we like to associate with. Enemies are the people we fight. And the last fight I had was in kindergarten. <laughs> Some guy was part of a group, about 10 kids, who were taunting me. Um, and you all know how graceful kids can be when they gang up on one. And that taunting went on until I got so angry that I picked the loudest one and went after him. I was always bigger and much stronger than anyone else. Three guys stepped in my way. Three guys went down click quickly. <laughs> and that frightened the loud mouth so much that he took off. But I was not just strong, I was also quick. And so he tried to hide behind the kindergarten teacher. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, we were outside and the kindergarten teacher was inside and between us was a closed glass door. And the guy went right through the closed door like a brick. Then they took them to hospital because he needed stitches. According to Jesus, that is not how his disciples are supposed to deal with conflict. We read, Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. And I definitely did not do that. And when I examine my heart, I'm still proud of the fact that I took on 10 other boys and the ringleader ended up in hospital and I didn't even have to touch him. <laughs> Remember what I told you in the children's sermon? I'm preaching as much to you as I'm preaching to myself. Pick up your cross and follow me, says Jesus. Much later, in my early 20s, I went to Israel to be a kibbutz volunteer for a couple of months. And the kibbutz members always showed their volunteers the country. So every month they took us on a trip, floating down the Jordan in uh, truck tires, going to the Lebanese border, waving at Austrian peacekeepers, desert in various forms, and one time they took us to En Gedi at the Dead Sea. It's a, a place that mentioned in the Bible. Everywhere in Israel, people are armed, and so were we. A dozen guys with assault rifles. And one guy who liked me very much gave me his Galil assault rifle to carry. This was meant as a token of appreciation, even though it was illegal. So I'm walking through the desert, blue kibbutz uniform, kibbutz hat and assault rifle, and that's when I met the first Palestinians. A father, a mother, and there are four daughters. I will never forget the look they gave me. They didn't say anything, because there were a lot of us, and as a group, we didn't, didn't look like a peaceful, easy-going bunch. We were clearly on one side of the conflict, and I will never forget that look. I was their enemy, and they did not love me. Until I went to Israel, I thought I was a pacifist. But I could not prevent that. That conflict sucked me in and put me firmly on one side. 
And when you are in a conflict, it is difficult to question the side you're on. Your side, this is where you have meaningful relationships. The other side is rather abstract. Normally, you don't know the people on the other side. You know some facts and some rumors about them. And sometimes hmm, you try to figure out what drives them, but most of the time you didn't even bother to find out their motivations. They are the enemy. That's all you need to know. And if you look at that picture in the bulletin, you see a bunch of guys who look like the role they play. Are you contemplating what they are like when they sit at home? What they like to eat? What music they hear? How they play with their kids? No, what we see, what I see, are the RPGs, the uniforms, and that matches what we see in the news when they tell us that people who look like them blew something up again. And we look at them and we are reminded that on the news we saw their leaders who promise our destruction because we are seen as a very source of evil in the world. Of course, we don't see ourselves that way. We know the narrative that puts us against them and people who look like them. I'm pretty sure that they don't care about our stories either, uh, how we are at home around the dinner table and playing with our kids. And in return, we don't care how they are as sons, fathers, or spouses. I carry that look of the Palestinian family with me. A fleeting moment, mere seconds encounter, but I cannot forget it. Maybe one of those militants had a similar experience, maybe not. We don't know their stories, but they must be more complex than that we, what, what we see on the photo. One of my favorite movies is The Cruel Sea. A 1953 British movie that tells the story of a convoy escort vessel in the Battle of the Atlantic. During the whole six years of war, they never see their enemy, except for once when they manage to sink a U-boat and they fish a few survivors out of the water. And one of the sailors looks at the U-boat crew, wet, cold, and frightened, and remarks, they look like us. I think the same could be said about those militant fighters if we would fish them out of the water. Below the gun-toting militancy, they look like us. One thing is certain. If we want peace, we have to make peace with the enemy. Nobody has problems talking peace with a bunch of nice guys from down the streets. We need to take peace with people who look like those on the photo. And it's absolutely possible that those guys don't want peace. We can't know that until we ask them, and we can't change it if they don't want peace. The question we have to ask is this. Do we want peace? And if the answer is yes, what do we need to do to get there? We can't change other people, but we can change ourselves. Jesus calls us to love our enemies. And usually when we look at Jesus, we see wisdom. We see grace and we see love. And assuming that Jesus wants us to live and not to be shot or bombed to death, we need to be open to the fact that Jesus' demand to love our enemies makes sense, even if it seems impossible to do at first. Jesus is not in the habit to utter unreasonable nonsense. If it makes sense, then maybe this call to love your enemy makes also sense. I think the task is like eating an elephant. And how do you eat an elephant? Bite by bite, exactly. You have to start somewhere and then you see where it takes you. And the first thing I suggest to you and to me is not to see the enemy as enemies, but as human beings. That, of course, is a suggestion for a relatively affluent congregation that is mostly white. Um, we are a dominant segment of our society. I think love your enemy works differently when you're part of an oppressed minority. 
but those militant guys we don't meet on the street. They are far away, our drones, drones fly over them, and the most powerful military on earth is protecting us. We can ask ourselves, what drives them? What makes these young guys on the photo pick up arms? Are we just righteous innocents who fell victim to unexplainable hostility, or do we play a role in the circumstances that radicalized them? I don't love these guys, and maybe I never will. But I want to know what brought them to the point that they pose for a photo like this. And that I will only find out if and when I critically evaluate the stories that we tell about them. Reality is irrevocably lost when we start to believe our own propaganda. This world is complex. As I see it, the first step in loving your enemy is interest in your enemy. Who are they? What motivates them? I don't know if that leads to love, but it might. I deeply believe in Jesus' promise of new life. So I think Jesus' call to love our enemies is also life-giving. I'm pretty sure it will help us more than it will help them. It sets us free from being driven by our emotions toward the enemy. I don't think it's a call to surrender. It's a call to clear our heads and calm our hearts. Amen.